Content warning, Nazis and everything that go with them, eugenics, anti-Semitism, and genocide. Action, excitement, horror, romance, thrills and chills, swords and sorcery, rockets and ray guns, a dizzying canopy of the strange and impossible from the darkest depths of the human imagination. What mad universe encompasses such tales as these? Join us as we bear witness to the sweeping sprawl of all the history that never was and all the futures that could yet be. It's adventure as you like it on What What Mad Universe. Adolf Hitler was born in Austria on April 20, 1889. As a young man, he migrated to Germany and served in the German army during the Great War. After the war, he dabbled briefly in radical politics in Munich, before finally emigrating to New York in 1919. By 1932, he was a regular illustrator for the science fiction magazines, and by 1935, he had enough confidence in his English to make his debut as a science fiction writer. Although best known to present-day sci-fi fans for his novels and stories, Hitler was a popular illustrator during the golden age of the 30s, edited several anthologies, wrote lively reviews, and published a popular fanzine, Storm, for nearly 10 years. He won a posthumous Hugo at the 1955 World Science Fiction Convention for Lord of the Swastika, which was completed just before his death in 1953. For many years, he had been a popular figure at sci-fi conventions, widely known in science fiction fandom as a wit and non-stop raconteur. Ever since the book's publication, the colorful costumes he created in Lord of the Swastika have been favorite themes at convention masquerades. Hitler died in 1953, but the stories and novels he left behind remain as a legacy to all science fiction enthusiasts. Let Adolf Hitler transport you to a far future Earth, where only Farrakh Jagar and his mighty weapon, the Steel Commander, stand between the remnants of true humanity and annihilation at the hands of the totally evil Dominators and the mindless mutant hordes they completely control. Hi, welcome to What Mad Universe. I'm Adam Prosser. With me is Philip Rice. Hi. Hello. Uh, today we're talking about a book. Uh, that was published in 1972. Uh, I know that was probably a confusing intro. Uh, <laughs> it's the intro that is in the book. Uh, it's a book uh, within a book, sort of. Uh, it's called The Iron Dream by Norman Spinrad. Um, and it basically postulates what if Hitler had uh, gotten out of Germany and become a science fiction writer in America instead. And uh, then most of it is the book that he wrote that he's best known for, which is called Lord of the Swastika. Uh, which is a sci-fi fantasy epic. Um, so it's sort of... Uh, kind of problematic. And uh, <laughs> surprisingly, it's problematic, yes. Um, and and uh, so it is a, a book that is deliberately um, kept at a remove from you the whole time because you know the backstory of this book. It's not just Norman Spinrad writing a book. It's a book where you're... Um, you're aware of the author. I, <laughs> I actually couldn't help but be a, a bit think of uh, Garth Marenghi's Dark Place, mm. uh, which, <laughs> although some people who worked with him might say Garth Marenghi was like Hitler, but um, I don't mean that he was like Hitler in that way. I just mean that uh, in the the show Garth Marenghi's Dark Place, they create the fictional author, and they you're always reminded of the author's own hangups as the story is unfolding, basically. Mm. So this is the same thing. It is, of course, uh, clearly written in line with Nazi ideology, but it's a novel that exists in a world where the Nazis didn't really exist. Mm. So it is, but you can, so it's kind of a sense of what if it was all subliminal sci-fi? And it kind of ties into the kind of stuff we've been talking about with And Paul, it's also a critique of uh, science fiction in general. Uh, exactly. The, the book was initially intended as a criticism of uh, uh, Joseph Campbell's uh, Hero with a Thousand Faces. Oh, really? Specifically, yeah. That's well, that in general, um, that the idea of just how 
neatly fascist ideology f- slots into that. Right. I mean, well, that's one of the interesting things to me. Um, mythology, we talk about like mythology and folklore, but they're not, those aren't really the same thing. Um, mm-hmm. Folklore is, like it says, folklore, it's the common stories and and folk tales that people tell and share around the campfire. Whereas mythology is more the stuff that gets handed down on high. And um, I, I had a friend once refer to mythology saying it was all either to explain why the world was created or why the people who are in charge need to be in charge. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's always kind of a, I mean, it's tied to religion, obviously, when it's it's always somebody's religious stories. But it's always, it, it often tends to come back down to one bloodline, essentially, and one one monarch and their 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 line if not literally the actual monarch of but then sort of an idealized monarch of that kingdom or that country right um you know greek mythology does tend to produce you know it says well the gods and they had demigod children and then you know in greece and rome like sparta tied itself to the trojan war if i'm not mistaken uh helen was from sparta so i'm not sure who the descendant uh, like the the mythological descendant of ancient sparta was um you know of course ancient japan has literally their ancestors their uh, emperor is supposed to be descended from suzano the uh, sun god like basically every every country that had its own mythology or every nation has you know a point where oh yes and then the gods had gave birth to a line of heroes who eventually produced our current monarch right Mm -hmm. so i I mean that is why it kind of tends to plug into the fascism pretty well because fascism is kind of a non-religious a more secular attempt to bring forward all the you know that those same ideas. Well, as um, Roger Griffin, who was a political um, theorist, said, uh, he defined uh, fascism in its simplest terms as palingenetic ultranationalism. Right. Basically, the idea that uh, there used to be a golden age. There used to be a time when our nation was great, and now it's not great, and we need to make it great again. <laughs> yes, right. There's literally, I mean, the term golden age literally comes from Greek mythology. Yeah. The idea that there was a, an um, ideal time, there's the Garden of Eden, there's struck, all that stuff. Oh, sorry. What struck me immediately about the, uh, and the opening you read is the opening of the book, as you said, um, the part that stuck out at me is the idea of uh, Hitler's costumes being worn at fan conventions. Right. And I just thought, this is... This was uh, from 1972, so it's five years before Star Wars even came out. Mm-hmm. But it really reminds me of Stormtrooper cosplay. Right, and how exactly. popular that is. Yeah, yeah. Because Stormtroopers are space Nazis. I mean, right. they're named after an actual troop of or yeah. the Stormtroopers from the Nazi party. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, that is, that is basically one of the, if not the central point of the novel, which is that it gets alarming how you can ally, you know, fa- sci-fi fandom with... Uh, you know, the kind of rabid partisan nationalism that in our world became Nazism. Mm-hmm. Uh, so oh, that was... I'm not saying anybody who dresses as stormtrooper is well, a Nazi, but no, like it just there's the idea that uh, I don't know. Some people are more drawn to the to these sorts of fascist fictional right. fascist characters, like all the Kylo Ren fan fans who really yeah. want him to you know yeah. be the hero of the story yeah. or whatever. Well, it's I mean. Yeah, let's be clear. I mean, it's one thing because the, the stormtroopers look cool and Darth Vader looks cool and you want to wear that cool costume. It's another thing that there are do seem to be people who... I, I remember somebody online going uh, a while ago, he said, well, which would you choose, the Empire or the Jedi? Who's to... Or oh, the Rebel? That was the, that was the Star Wars Twitter account. Right. <laughs> so it literally was saying... Like, it was like, who, who the... the, the uh, what was it? The Resistance or the First Order? Yeah. Like One of it, those are Nazis. Yeah, exactly. One of them was, you're, you're trying to choose which, which like, they presented almost as a weirdly neutral choice. Like houses in Harry Potter. Right. Well, and I mean, let's be clear, Star Wars is in no way ambiguous about who's good and who's evil, mm-hmm. but there are definitely people who are weirdly, I've heard people go like, well, uh, the Empire wasn't actually that bad. How are we to say that they aren't really the good guys? It's like, well, they blow up planets. Yeah. That's kind of a... Oh, yeah. Bill Crystal, the uh, the oh yeah, Republican right. said he as a kid he rooted for the Empire. Right, right, yeah. He said so. I mean, and that was kind of trolling. Obviously, he was trying to make. I think, but I and I mean, Bill Crystal's terrible person. Yeah. Obviously, but th- what I mean is he's trying to make a big. Uh, he was trying to make a splash and get clicks essentially. Mm. Um, 
another thing I was reminded of is um, um, <clears throat> Paul Verhoeven uh, when he was making Starship Troopers. Oh, right, right. Um, some of the be- what, like literally as it was as it came out or even as it was being made and there were interviews and stuff, they would say like, well, we made them look like the Nazis because the Nazis had all the cool stuff. And it's, that's the cool, that's the cool designs that we want to use for our movie, which was obviously to hide what the actual point of the movie mm. was. And again, obviously Starship Troopers has a similarity to what we're seeing here. And in fact, um, Spinrad was probably, Heinlein was probably one of the people Spinrad was kind of poking at with this book. Mm. Uh, the, the we're used to Starship Troopers being a movie where it's, you know, it has the same thing. It's kind of pseudo ironic. It's kind of making fun of itself as it were, mm-hmm. uh, because it presents heroes who are pretty obviously fascist. Um, but the book of course, isn't like that. It's non ironically presented as it would be good if the army ran everything mm-hmm. essentially. So the book, the movie is essentially Verhoeven going, well, here's what I think of that basically. Yeah. <laughs> and to the point where of course people were upset for years about the movie and they kept making sequels that were more serious sequels to, what, oh, yeah, you know, completely missing the point. Right. Exactly. Apparently each one of the sequels has a, has a segment that's mm-hmm. like a in universe, uh, propaganda thing. Uh-huh. So, like, that's lip service to the uh, aesthetic of the original movie. Right. But the rest of it is just played straight. Right, right. Well, I mean, to be fair, the the the, the original movie was played straight enough that it's only the little seg- side segments that really tip you off. Mm-hmm. Um, like, they do present, you know, Johnny Rico like he's, you know, a likable enough hero and stuff. Because the thing is... You watch it now and it seems ludicrous, but remember, action movies were always like that in the 90s, right? Yeah. They were pretty over the top in general. They so. have Neil Patrick Harris coming out in a full oh. SS uniform. Yeah, <laughs> at that point, it's pretty obvious what they're doing, right? But but it ta- that's at the, near the end of the movie yeah. when that happens. So it takes a while for you to really, for it to really click in. But anyway, so uh, so the Iron Dream, like I say, most of it is about this book that he wrote, Lord of the Swastika, which again, it, it kind of seems like he's taking a swipe at Lord of the Rings, which I feel is maybe a little unfair in uh, some ways. Oh, I didn't pick that up at all, but yeah, well, I but guess. the fact that he well, didn't they say it isn't the idea that being that Lord of the Swastika occupies the space that Lord of the Rings occupies in our culture in this alternate reality? Isn't maybe that, I didn't pick that up, but maybe I, I thought I'd heard that that was. I may, may not have been Spinrad himself, but that was what somebody suggested. I, I could see it. I just didn't pick it up. Um, Michael Moorcock, who wrote the Elric books, which we did a, a show about uh, at one point, he did a famous uh, essay called uh, Epic Poo, uh, P-O-O-H, as in Winnie the Pooh, uh, in which he kind of uh, tore into Lord of the Rings because he feels that it's um, it's very reactionary or or regressive at least Mm because it's very much about again well like you say it's got that golden age oh it was so much better back in the day but at the same time i mean tolkien was literally talking about well then there was this world war it's not weird that he would think it was better before the world war right Mm -hmm. um and i mean tolkien lord of the rings is like it celebrates sort of the quote almost literally lesser race of the hobbits right like it's n- it's in no way saying oh yeah you have to have the shining ideal yeah it has uh, some problematic elements but it's not straight up fascist right. by any means right any e- and even putting aside of course the famous tolkien encounter with the actual nazis that he had uh where he told a nazi publisher who wanted to publish the hobbit and who was asking him about his jewish heritage to very politely he told him to go suck an egg basically <laughs> um being Tolkien, he was very polite about it, but yeah, he was he was clearly and he's yeah and he he called Hitler a ruddy little ignoramus at one point. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he was in no way enamored of uh, of uh, of the Nazis, and not just because he was British. I think it's fair to say that you know his his own mentality was not in that direction. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think more what Spinrad might be saying in this book more is just there's a strain of fandom and sword and sorcery type uh fans and fantasy fans and sci-fi fans who might lean in that general direction which is hard to argue with these days oh yeah it's very true yes um like this this book is very prescient on a number of things not just the stormtrooper thing but mm -hmm. uh i mean i guess we'll get into it a bit later but uh there's a part where the main character of the novel uh ferric jagger or jagger which literally means iron hunter Mm. um uh he um he's obviously it, within the novel a uh, stand in for Hitler himself but an idealized form so he's tall and blonde and mm-hmm. he doesn't walk he strides right um 
and uh, you know he's he's perfect in every way. He never makes any mistakes. He's he has iron will at all times. He right. never loses a fight. Um, and uh, but there's a part where um, uh, he's trying to figure out how to disseminate his propaganda to s- spread his party's message, and uh, he turns on the television, which they have, mm-hmm. even though it's post-apocalyptic. It's kind of, the technology's <laughs> yeah. all over the place. We'll get into that. Yeah. But um, he turns on the television and sees that they're covering some of his uh, party's uh, violence, and he's just shocked that they would just show, you know, what you know show their uh their rallies or their their what they say and it, it just reminds me of you know recent events with like right. the uh new york times doing an article on richard spencer calling him the dapper white nationalist yeah. taking actually it was mother what? jones oh mother that jones that, okay you believe it um but yeah in new york Times. yeah well that's the idea in in the book jagger is literally like oh let them show us let them and and you know clearly the media of this world is is going oh look at this threat but they're like no we like it when you show us because that you know we we use our imagery and we use our ideology uh you know to to accrue followers mm-hmm. basically so the louder megaphone we get no matter what you're saying about us the happier we are yeah um and again he's writing this in 1972 and it's it's very prescient you know he, he's they they do talk a lot about how it was all this carefully crafted imagery to sort of work on people's subconscious to bypass mm-hmm. the rational mind yeah because fascism is not a rational ideology it's it's an emotional one at its core um it, it's about you know there's people out there trying to keep you down and we yeah. have to you know right and, and um part but of also it, yeah this the sexualization that he talks oh yeah about. we'll yeah. we'll get into that but i wanted to talk about uh uh one as well first we'll bring up uh oh umberto echo uh was a uh uh, he grew up in fascist Italy. He was a um, uh, a linguist and talk about the meaning. Well, no, he wasn't a linguist. What, what was this? Well, he was a writer. Okay, he was a writer and he wrote about uh, uh, the meanings of things, basically. And uh, he wrote uh, an essay in 1995 called The Eternal Fascist about um, uh, basically listing 14 common traits of fascism. We won't go into all of them, but uh, this book... Yeah, you know, fits all of them. Like, um, right. Spinrad obviously had a good handle on what fascism was about. Right. Um, and one of them that stood out to me was the idea that the enemy is both strong and weak. Right. I believe that's number eight. Yeah. And uh, it was um, really fits this book because the the enemy in, in this book is uh, Zind, which is obviously Zion, and obviously they're the Jews. Yeah. Um, and they they have an army of mindless mutants that they mind control, um, and there's it's like a vast army, like just so many disposable troops. But Ferric just blows through them like nothing. Right. Yeah. And uh, it, it's uh, yeah, uh, sorry. Uh, as you say, it's like they have to. It's a thing where um, the book is challenged as a book. If you read it, you know, unironically. Uh, without the the distance, you're kind of like it's not a very good book because you know the hero can't ever be seriously challenged because he's so great and so competent, and the bad guys are so bad they have to be defeated. It made me think of Ayn Rand actually, where the villains are all uh, you know the the her villains are always like bad and incompetent and doomed to lose to the hero mm. basically. But they but then how do you have a story where the villains? Can never be competent yeah. and never succeed. And how did these how did these villains take control of the world in the first place if they're so incompetent? Yeah, I mean, ironically, this book makes it more logical because the it's the dominators who have mental control over people. They're telepathic, basically, mm. so they can form armies and they can infiltrate. Uh, you know, the Helden, which is the kingdom of the heroes, um, which uh, like so it's it's their mental control that's that's causing mm. uh, that thing. Despite dis- and they're they're mutants. Um, Oh, yeah, we should talk about the basic setting of the novel within a novel. Uh, It's post-apocalyptic, so like, uh, but really far into the future. So not like Mad Max, but like thousands of years uh, post-nuclear war. Yeah. And uh, there are some true humans left, and the last true human kingdom is Helden, which is German for heroes. Right. Um, And uh, uh, the, um, the rest of the world is mostly populated by mutants, so these are genetic offshoots uh, uh, resulting from the nuclear war. So there's mm. p- 
parrot faces and blue skins and patched skins and hunchback dwarves and pinheads and so forth. To- toad men. Toad men, right? Yeah. Uh, and but the most evil race of mutants are the dominators, uh, who can control minds and they can they can infiltrate held in society. But you know the the heroes can always spot them. Right. Without fail, like well, there's no false positives. They can. Well, to be fair, Ferric, like they, they, they control a lot of uh, the Helden, the quote true, true man Heldens. Mm. Uh, they even them, they get their mental hooks. It's only Ferric who's strong enough. Yeah, to, yeah. Well, to, I mean the heroes by, yeah. you know, the true, you know, right. The the people who have have the iron will and the uh, right, <laughs> right. And it is very much a, and this is where, um, yeah, the story is just Ferric Jagger uh, coming back to Heldon. It's actually, the plot is very simple and actually gets very sort of pointless and repetitive <laughs> as it gets to the, once it gets going. But he, he, he comes to Hel- back to Heldon. He was raised in another country and he's sort of been ashamed his whole life of not being part of Heldon. He comes back to Heldon. Uh, he discovers that Heldon is itself is being infiltrated by mutants, yeah. and they're letting. He gets in, in too easily. He yeah. finds they're like letting. They don't. They don't do enough tests on him. Yeah, they're letting all those immigrants in, yeah. um, and they need to build a wall. Uh, but no, so, literally, yes. yeah, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And he gets mad that they let uh, they let some you know obvious mutants in to do you know on day passes to do work in the that other people don't want to do. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And um, and. So he, you know, but he's able to discover there's a dominator in the what's it called the cla- the classification, classification bureau. Or yeah, uh, later on they become classification camps. But, right. Uh, yeah. We'll get into that. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, uh, you can probably <laughs> interpret yourself because anyway, he he kills this one dominator. He forms no, a party. no. He forms a he forms a mob to kill them. Right. That's like, right. Yes. He rallies a mob. Um, the the most interesting sort of plot thing is as he's kind of rising to power, uh, he's traveling to the to the capital and he gets uh, waylaid by a motorcycle gang, um, which is what are they called again? The Black Avengers. Black Avengers initially they become the Knights of the Swastika once he right takes over their group right in and, a in an initiation ritual which he right. goes through with ease. Yeah, he de- he defeats their uh, their leader. Uh, who he he respects, he thinks, because yeah. the, they're already a racist, anti mutant uh, crew who are down to preserve the human genotype and everything. So it, these res- are the brown shirts. Yeah, essentially, yeah. Um, or yeah, I don't. I, I'm sorry, I don't know all the different uh, Nazi regiments that existed because there was the SS and there was. Uh, this the, was like before they took power. The sort of. I guess you could say proud right. boys of their time. Yeah, they, they yeah. like beat people up in the streets. And right, they were the violent uh, wing. Yeah, and I think the fact that they're a motorcycle gang, I think he's tying it a bit. Spinrad is tying it a bit to, um, uh, like there are at the time and to this day there are fascist motorcycle gangs. Yep. Right, uh, it's not not to say all bikers are like that necessarily, but there are definitely. Um, if you've ever seen a movie called The Wild Angels with Peter Fonda in the sick made in the sixties before Easy Rider. Um, it was also him as a biker. Um, it's actually kind of the precursor, but it's it was made. It's a Roger Corman movie, and he actually hung out with the Hell's Angels, uh, and he showed they loved to wear swastikas, and they did it. And it was again, it, they were doing it because it would shock people, and people would be horrified. And even in the movie, and these are the heroes, mind you, yeah. although they're kind of anti-heroes. It's not like they, you know, they look up to them. But um, the uh, there are people who you know who are the man, but some of them are like, hey man, I. I was fighting people wearing that symbol in World War Two, right? And and there, you know, it's of course it's the '60s counterculture of oh, the man doesn't, you know, don't uh, you don't have to have respect for authority. But the guy in authority is literally saying, well, hey, I fought Nazis, you know, <laughs> and and we're wearing and these are young kids who are like, well, not kids, but younger people who had who had who were who were doing it for shock value basically, mm-hmm. and who they had no idea. Well, they didn't fight in World War Two. Oh yeah, and that that reminds me of the the punk movement in the seventies and eighties. Yeah, using swastikas just to shock people, and eventually yeah. that turning into skinhead groups. And... Yeah, yeah, exactly. That was that was an, an ongoing issue that they'd had over the years uh, with with various counterculture movements as we as people got away from World War Two. So I think Spinrad is specifically tying yeah, it into yeah. that as well. So it's post you know Nazi era think uh, connections, um, but uh, yeah. Anyway. Uh, yeah, and also, uh, Ferric, uh, this is introduced right before he picks it up, but there, it's sort of uh, an Excalibur situation. Right. Where there's uh, the ancient uh, uh, kings of, of Heldon um, had wizards, because there's 
wizards all of a sudden in this universe. Um, well, I read that as sort of it's far in the future and they've lost touch with the actual technology. Okay, that existed, fair enough. But but uh, it's clearly defi- mystical. They, and, they do defy physics somehow. Yeah, with this. it's it's a it's a um, a truncheon that can only be picked up uh, that. Uh, uh, can only be picked up by the uh, a bloodline, pure bloodline descended from the king, right. from the king, uh, from the royal family. Right. Um, it's a truncheon shaped like a big fist. Right. Yes. Or the 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 ball on the end is shaped like a fist. Right. Um, it's called the Steel Commander, and uh, Ferric learns he can pick it up, and he uses that to. Yeah, because they talk about how it's like the the weight of a it's a you know, the a weight tr- of a mountain, yeah. a mountain. T- well, pro- probably an exaggeration, but yeah, he can hold it, which only the true line of no, no, it blah. says it's literally the weight of the mountain, except in the hands of a right of of what is it the person with the like the of the the descent of the correct yeah yeah the blood uh, lineage line. not yeah, not lineage. merely a pure bred human yeah, but yeah. the specific line that yeah, is yeah. A, and of course it's 100% king arthur uh but obviously you're now tying it to you know fascist ideology mm-hmm. of yes i'm the i'm the chosen one and that is why we say people have said this more and more recently about how the chosen one narrative has <laughs> some issues for that exact yes. reason it's basically about how you have the right genes so you are the right person and you should be in charge basically Mm -hmm. um which is why it was entertaining to me that the new star wars the best thing about the new star wars is that they're kind of going against that basically and that's what certain fans are mad about which again there's toxic elements in (laughs) sci-fi fandom it is yeah um but um, anyway, so yeah, there's a there's a whole you know he he seizes the leadership, and after that it doesn't feel so it has that kind of as you say Joseph Campbell feel to it up until that point. Uh, then once he sort of seizes control, then he gets elected and forms a party, and various things happen, and it starts to feel less like any kind of real adventure story to me, and more just a pseudo retelling of the nazis uh, uh right that and also uh just ferric being right about everything yeah and um just uh waltzing or striding through life with <laughs> right um facing very little real with, opposition with snap and dash they yes say, snap about and 500 dash. times yes. and uh, oh uh there's um uh somebody did a list of uh repeated words Racial will appears 31 times. <laughs> Leather appears 69 times. Yeah. Nice. Uh, and steel appears uh, 142 times. Uh-huh. Yeah. It's, it's, and I mean, um, there's actually a review by Ursula K. Le Guin uh, of this book, which, mm-hmm. uh, and she, yeah, I saw that. She has a, a sort of, insu- she got it, sort of, she got it right away. And as she, and I was, as I was reading, I was kind of thinking, you know, this is, as I basically said, it's a bad book. It kind of has to be a bad book because it's by Adolf Hitler. Yeah. And she says, you know, that's 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 exactly the point, is that if Adolf... As you say, the hero can't face any real challenges because that would, go, that would go against Hitler's psychology. The hero can't have sort of complicated underlying urges because that would be acknowledging something in the whole fascist makeup that they don't want to acknowledge, mm-hmm. right? Um, so it's got all that kind of stuff uh, as well. But, but at the same time, it doesn't make for a very pleasant read. No, no. It's good that it's a short novel because yeah. you, you sort of get to the point. Well, if if I can indulge myself here, I was as I was reading this, I was kind of thinking, here's, uh, you know, you could adapt this as a as a movie. But if I was going to adapt it as a movie, what I would do is I wouldn't just retell, I wouldn't tell the story. I'd make it like a fake documentary in this alternate world. And it was like a look back at Adolf Hitler and his his science fiction career, basically. And it would talk about the story, but I wouldn't like, you know, maybe there'd be clips and reenactments, but you wouldn't have to go into the plot in that. And you could talk about how the the various um, people behind the scenes, you know, reacted to Hitler in different ways. Um, Another person I think Spinrad was probably taking a swipe at here was uh, John W. Campbell, um, who was the editor of Astounding Magazine. In fact, it's... uh, I, sorry, they say Amazing Magazine, not Astounding Magazine. Um, but he was the editor. Uh, he wrote the novel, or the, not the novel, a short uh, story called uh, Who Goes There, which is actually the basis for The Thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and in fa- it's interesting because it was written, uh, the original story was adapted into The Thing from Another World in the 50s, which is a good movie, but it's actually very different from mm-hmm. the story. Then the John Carpenter movie of The Thing in the 80s is actually closer to the original story uh, than the, the adaptation they made in the 50s. Um, but he was n- very famously a racist guy. Um, he's uh, you were you were saying you were we've been slightly inspired by uh, talking about the Deep Space Nine episode um, 
um, Far Beyond the Stars, in which uh, the hero of the, the story, Cisco, Ben Cisco, uh, sees himself as a, a, a black science fiction writer in the 1950s. And it does, it is in some, it actually has some similarities. So what we're talking about, it reflects on, you know, the way science fiction is uh, viewed by our culture and how the characters in the, the story of Deep Space Nine would reflect in our world. And uh, the character of Odo, who is uh, kind of a, he's a hero, but he's the, you know, he's a sort of fascist by training almost. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he's collaborated with the, the Cardassians who are the bad guys. And he's, he's trying to do the right thing, but, you know, his history and his even his makeup as one of these changelings is that he he wants to be a fascist basically and in the alternate reality of this story he's he's the editor who's basically saying well you know i love your stories ben but you know they're they're they, nobody'll buy them it's too it's too it's too much for liberal intellectuals and stuff no, we're we're doing pulp specifically here. a black captain in space yeah yeah. he wanted to write yeah he wanted to have black characters in a science fiction story in the 50s which Mm. was at the time so they make him kind of and he and they make him more sympathetic where he's going you know oh i i sympathize but the bosses will never go for it and he Mm. keeps he keeps standing between uh ben what's his name i can't remember it's not ben cisco in the story he has a different name well Uh, he's ben something yeah it's ben something um Anyway, he, he uh, and, and in real life, Campbell was apparently even worse. He was literally, you know, he would never have hired a black guy in the first place. Yeah. Um, he was apparently notorious for saying, you know, um, uh, I, you know, you can't have humans be, uh, you can't have aliens who are superior to humans, mm-hmm. um, which, gee, I wonder what that was sublimated about. Yeah. Uh, but literally, they tried to write a story, well, the humans get conquered by aliens. No, 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 humans will always conquer aliens. Like, how do you know that, John? That's yeah. just any sense and um and i mean people like isaac asimov who was you know for the for the 50s and 60s he was a very you know you know he was he supported the civil rights movement and you know he was you know he used to push back against that but uh, the irony is that at the same time a lot of these people who may have not have felt the same way owe their careers to john w campbell Mm -hmm. right he played a huge role and one of the biggest awards in science fiction was until just very recently you may have heard about this called the john w campbell award um i don't know if you heard about this they just changed the name of it uh one of the winners is it now uh, I, I think it's just called the I don't know the sci- uh, the World Science Fiction Award or something okay. like that. But uh, one of the uh, the winners was a woman named uh, Jeanette Ng, uh, who's Asian, obviously, and she uh, she literally said, "Well, I'm honored to win this award, but I want to mention the fact that it's named after this horrible racist." Yeah, basically. it's like. Uh, it's like if there was a Lovecraft award or something. Uh, there is. Oh, I and, know there is. But they, I mean, yeah. yeah, yeah. They changed. Well, they changed the name of that one too, didn't yeah. they? Just recently. Yeah. Uh, I, I think there was like a bust. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Sorry, it's not the Lovecraft award. It was a bust of H.P. Lovecraft. Yeah, that was, was it. the award. It's the World Fantasy Award, mm-hmm. and they changed it so that it's not a bust of H.P. Lovecraft yeah. anymore, basically. So. Um. Anyway, uh, speaking of D- Deep Space Nine, uh, a lot of this book reminded me of. Uh, uh, Garrick's description of uh, Cardassian novels. <laughs> yes, because it just you know because the the entire idea of the novel is to yeah. is to uh, enforce loyalty yeah. to the state. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's all, and it's all about how every generation grows up and works for the state and then dies and then the next generation comes yeah. up. Yeah, and also they're mystery novels. Everybody's guilty. <laughs> yeah, right. They don't have mystery. Yet. Yeah, exactly. It's the kind of thing where well, he's not a good writer. He 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 wants to. Uh, it's more the work of someone who wants to impose his will on everyone mm-hmm. than to tell a story that brings you in and has a dialogue with the reader in any way. Yeah, um, I that's always something I found interesting: the fact that Hitler was an artist, right? <laughs> he was yeah. before anything else. And, um, and you know, there's a lot made about him being really bad, but he, as an artist, <laughs> yeah. he was bad. Yeah, uh, yeah, but as an artist, he was mediocre, basically. Yeah, like exactly. he was. Nowadays, he probably would have been pretty passable uh in terms of in certain careers like yeah. illustration and yeah he, he just painted like very well that was the thing because he painted very this is it, a chicken and egg situation but he painted very uh, conventional traditional you know buildings and landscapes mm. and so on at a time when i mean the 20s and 30s were an explosion of all like pablo picasso and the impre- the expressionists and, and, all and kinds especially of- in weimar germany which was very progressive as we talked about right. in our uh episode on uh dr mabuse right yeah he was he was yeah it was sort of so he was trying to get into the the prestigious art school i forget the name of it uh and they they basically said well this is you know this is 
stuff really to hang boring. on your wall. Yeah. This is stuff to decorate your apartment with. It's not great art, basically. Mm -hmm. And whether, you know, it's probably simplistic to say, and that's what turned him bad. But, you know, it was that, you know, it, he started by raving against, oh, it's all these uh, degenerate art forms. Oh, that yeah. Are and inevitably had, it was uh, the Nazis rants. put out a, um, uh, an art exhibit called Degenerate Art, which was uh, a bunch of uh, abstract or sexually provocative thing, and often by Jewish uh, artists. Right. And uh, it was very popular, and it was, but people would go there to be told, you know, this is gross. It was like a weird voyeuristic thing. Like. Yeah, 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 exactly. Which is funny because it's kind of the reverse of what the Nazis were saying, like, oh, if we get our stuff in it, on TV, even if it's framed as bad, it's good for us. And this is like, well, you're going to promote the art that you say is degenerate and people are going to look at it. If you actually had the total control over, you know, over mm -hmm. everyone's minds that you, that you aspire to have, you would still be introducing you know, people to something that <laughs> that yeah. might, if if Germany had really, if Nazi Germany had really, you know, had complete power, it would be like, well, I'm looking at this art and it's making me question the current <laughs> regime, kind of thing. Yeah, uh, no, that makes sense. Um, speaking of uh, Hitler's own taste and things, I wanted to bring up uh, uh, Hitler's favorite author was uh, Karl May, uh, or at least as a child, Hitler's favorite author was Karl May. Uh, who was a uh, uh, German con artist, basically. <laughs> well, yeah, that's lifelong con artist. Uh, he wrote a, uh, a series of westerns called Old Shatterhand about a, a German who went to the States and uh, became blood brothers with a, uh, I believe, Blackfoot named Chief Winnetow. And blood brothers aren't a thing that that particular tribe does. Uh, it was from a writer who had never actually left Germany at that time. But uh, once it became popular, Carl May started saying, yeah, yeah, I'm old Shatterhand. That's all based on my life. Right. And uh, people believed him. Like, he was a celebrity in Germany. And um, uh, Hitler was uh, such a big fan. Like, like he told his, uh, apparently, uh, I'm getting this from the uh, Behind the Bastards podcast, which did an episode on Carl May. I highly recommend that podcast, by the way. But... Um, Apparently, he told his military strategist to read Carl May for yeah. tips. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Even though they're, like, highly inaccurate, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and and these were pulpy novels, Yeah, very right? pulpy, were, yeah. yeah. Like, very, like, dime store adventure novels uh, right. for for young adults, basically. Yeah. And uh, Old Shatterhand had a, um, a signature weapon that was basically a steampunk machine gun. Right. So it could fire off how many... I, I don't know anything about guns, but yeah, how many bullets yeah. per second? Yeah, uh, well, I mean, technically they had Gatling guns in the later Old West, but I. But I, yeah, it's like a handheld rifle that could, mm -hmm. and uh, he claimed this was real, of course. Yeah. Um, and uh, some people say that uh, Hitler's later obsession with Wunderwaffen, the idea of this weapon that could revolutionize warfare, was uh, inspired partially by that. Yeah, it, it is fascinating, you know, to which. The degree to which these fascist leaders get caught up in sort of, you know, oh, it's going to be this way. It's, you know, we're, either they were inspired by something or they start saying, well, this story. It, it, and they become obsessed with the art side of it, right? Yeah. Um, like but, the, yeah, the Nazis... this reminded, like, uh, this just uh, uh, reminded me of this book. You know, it's fitting. I, Hitler... Well, would it have gone me... into pulpy stuff if he didn't go into politics. Yeah. Well, I mean, as the the this in this book, he became an illustrator, which yeah. makes sense because he was an artist, and then he becomes a writer. Which I, I'm actually not sure he would have become a writer in for real quote real. It's just they need that to happen for the story yeah. to, to happen. Um, it's also reminding me, but, how, but like, he was he was already sort of had a foot in that world. I said, yeah, I oh, for sure. No, I mean that is the point. Is to it's it's less about to talk about Hitler himself and more to talk about how there's this uncomfortable overlap in the mm. pulpy sci-fi fantasy genre spheres uh, and this whole fascist thing. I did... I Like we said, it's about how it feels, not right. how it, you know, yeah. actually makes sense. And there's... I mean, it is interesting that totalitarians have tended to have weird obsessions with media. Um, I'm thinking of how uh, uh, Kim Jong-il... Uh, oh yeah, was yeah. he he kidnapped a guy from uh from 
was it from South Korea or Japan? I think it was uh, South Korea. To make a kaiju movie because yeah. he decided North Korea needed its own kaiju <laughs> movie, basically, at one point uh, to, to tell the story of... And it's interesting that you get that from, yeah, the totalitarian side mm-hmm. of things. Oh, uh, the ending of the uh, of the novel within a novel is mm-hmm. um, uh, they conquer Zind, but at the last minute, uh, one of the remaining, or the last remaining dominator sets off a nuclear device which... Uh, will taint the gene pool permanently. Right. But luckily by then, they've discovered cloning technology. Right. Uh, so they create an army of all-male clones. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, it ends with a happy ending of them shooting a bunch of the clones into space to conquer the galaxy. Right. They they don't need to genet- reproduce traditionally anymore. They've now be, they've been able to genetically engineer a master race, which they can send out to conquer the yeah. universe. And each one, each uh, rocket will have a clone specifically of Farrakh on it. Right. Who will be the one in charge yeah. essentially? And it's it's uh, I mean that is a hundred percent. And as the uh, the conclusion, the concluding afterward points out, uh, it's a hundred percent the the Freudian sexual stuff going on. Yeah, with, yeah. Uh, with fascism. Uh, well, there, there's uh, part of part of Umberto, Umberto Eco's uh, uh, fourteen common traits of fascism is machismo, right? Uh, sublimated sexual desire into like a hyper masculine ideal, mm-hmm. uh, and. Uh, they just that, there was just an article today uh, pointing out that about you know how there's a there's an anti not just anti-feminist but like literally misogynist let's get women out of the equation altogether uh, thread running through the psychologies of and they were tying it to people nowadays like uh, Trump and Putin and people mm-hmm. like that but it's always been a case of no 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 it's all about the men and their de- their desire to assert their control over the world and sort of remove women and there are literally no women in this novel if i'm not yeah, mistaken oh, there's, there's not even a there's one woman mentioned frau right. something on a on the train that uh, Farrick is taking into town but no women speak right um and yeah that's and uh some women uh there's some women who appear mutants genetically engineered as sex slaves. Okay, um, yes, that's right. Who yes. appear they have exaggerated breasts and buttocks. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. Uh, other than that, there's no female characters whatsoever. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's something I noticed, and but they pointed it out at the end. I we'll, we'll get into that in a bit, but I don't like the ending. Yeah. But maybe it was necessary. No, it's well. They, no, let's talk about no, that no. Now, but I think, first, okay. I wanted to bring up uh, about the. Um, this reminded me of a uh, novel I read a while ago. Uh, from 1910, it's a proto-fascist novel. Obviously, it's before fascism was formed, but it's it's part of that tradition. Called uh, Mafarca the Futurist, an African novel, uh, and it was by Filippo Tommaso Marinetti. Marinetti. Um, yeah, it's it's terrible. I, I wouldn't recommend that to my worst enemy. Um, I, I actually read it through Google Translate because I didn't feel like buying oh. it. Um, but uh, I got the story. But it basically ends with the uh, with the heroic main character uh, creating a giant artificial uh, sun, giant winged orange man, and breathes his last breath into him to give him life. So, it, and it's explicitly the idea of creating life without the taint of womanhood. Right. And that's sort of the subtext of Frankenstein, but Frankenstein's right. critiquing that. But this exactly. is taking that and saying, oh, no, that's cool. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, Frankenstein is specifically about how, yeah, that, that's, that, you know, I, I obviously Frankenstein was a feminist critique of, you know, men trying to create without women. Uh, but I hadn't actually thought of the fascist parallel there until just now, basically. Yeah. Um, that's in, that's very interesting. But uh, let's just talk about the afterword. That yeah, exists. yeah. Um, um the the book obviously obviously it's very uh uh it, it's pretty obvious to any reasonable reader that uh that the uh, that the actual author doesn't agree with the fictional author's <laughs> worldview yeah but he was he was afraid that there would be uh people who did think that this was a pro nazi novel right and it seems there were actually there yeah. were uh a one what was it a uh, of it was a neo-Nazi reading group recommended yeah. it. Um, yeah, there was a yeah. It was. But yeah, uh, to to avoid this, and it, it seems it didn't work. So uh, <laughs> maybe it was necessary. But there's an afterword uh, written by a uh, a reviewer in Universe criticizing Hitler's work. Right. Um, 
And uh, it's the weakest part of it for me in right. terms of... Uh, Homer Whipple, his Homer name is. Whipple, who works at NYU. <laughs> right. uh, it does map out some of the alternate reality stuff, yeah. which also doesn't really work for me. Right, yeah. Um, yeah, in the, so this creates now an alternate reality in which basically communism took over Europe, uh, which kind of raises a bit of a, wait a minute, are you saying that nazism was good because it kept back communism i don't think that was his point uh it should be said um spinrad what is a uh uh anarchist right so yeah, he's, no, he's no. on the left he's, oh no i know spinrad would yeah. in no way <laughs> you know side with that with that viewpoint but at it all. still raises some questions and also the idea uh it says in the novel that the soviet union is responsible for the death of five million jews right and that's uncomfortable because it's like so you're saying the Holocaust was just a force of nature that would have right. happened anyway? And well, to, not be, a- to be fair, I think the point, his point there is that number is significantly lower than the number of people who died in the Holocaust, correct? It was Still, like, but it's... And, and that he's saying, like, we're looking at this as a tragedy, but look at what happened in our world, But it's not right? that much lower. Five million uh, yeah. versus six million Jews. Well, and, and I mean, it does need to be said. The Soviet Union had oh, yeah, strong definitely. anti-Semitic uh, pogroms and stuff as well. I definitely, mean, but it, it's still it's a it's a bit uncomfortable. Yeah, it's it's it's. I mean, that Left whole sour afterward. Note, yeah. Well, the whole afterward is there essentially. He uh, like it's very clear to me. Spinrad didn't really want to do that and sort of tacked it on to say. In my in many ways, I think the problem with it isn't so much that it it tells you this is how to feel. It's the problem that it it kind of spells out, like the subtext is all spelled yeah, out. Yeah, the, the idea that there's no female characters in it, which yeah. is something I noticed, but then it just outright says that. And it's right. Sort of, just yeah. sort of makes you feel less clever. Also, yeah, and also, I mean, that would not appear, if they were doing a new edition of this book in universe, they wouldn't have this very critical essay. Of yeah. It in the, I mean, you might have people who would critique it in interesting ways, but an introduction or an essay is always going to be, you know, praising the book, yeah, right? usually, essentially. Yeah. So uh, it would have been clever if you'd found a way to do that with someone mm-hmm. praising the book. Uh, you almost could have had someone in universe going, well, my enemies don't understand this book, but that's why they put me in jail, but I'm going <laughs> to, yeah, all right, no, you wouldn't be writing it from jail, but you know what yeah. I mean. It would be... Uh, <laughs> th- there is an interesting aspect that uh, Homer Whipple uh, refuses to entertain the idea that the Dominators stand in for Jews. Right, yeah. Uh, he says they're cool. obviously uh, s- the Soviet Union, and since the Soviet Union... Um, uh, uh, persecutes Jewish people, yeah. then therefore it's ridiculous that there would be any kind of conspiracy that right. that communism is a Jewish plot, right? Right. Which is something Hitler believes. Yeah, of so. course. <laughs> that was well. That yeah. I mean, he specifically says that so that you will go if you know anything, you're going to yeah. go. Yeah. Well, come on, <laughs> this guy is. You, but it is always interesting to see how people in an alternate world story will go. Well, of course that would never happen yeah. to something that did happen in our world, right? Yeah. You know? Well, and there's also uh, the part of the. Uh, the the end part where uh uh he talks about the the big rallies and how ridiculous they are and nobody yeah, would yeah. fall for this yeah exactly yeah, it's yeah. completely unrealistic that, that's entertaining that yeah bit. and anyway this afterwards only a few pages to be fair so yeah it's not, but it does have a sort of it it sort of it does land with a bit of a thud because it's obviously him going okay i feel like i need to put an asterisk here and yeah. make sure <laughs> no, everyone gets the point and they, as you say they still didn't and that's one of those issues with that we are always seeing with art even and especially nowadays where it's kind of like you can't. There's a movie coming out very soon called Jojo Rabbit, uh, by directed by and starring Taika Waititi, which is already getting, uh, you know, a lot of. Uh, there's some controversy because it is literally about a child imagining Adolf Hitler as his best friend during Nazi Germany, to be mm-hmm. clear. Uh, and it's, there's kind of a question of, you know, well, can this not be taken the wrong way? And many, many, we literally have Nazis out there right now. They're not. They're not slinking around the shadows. They're they're marching through town. So. Well, I'm sure this movie made by a Jewish man was not intended to be pro Hitler in any way. Well, the fact of the matter is, you yeah, can make you, you do have to be careful with how you do that because, uh, uh, as has been pointed out, say "Tomorrow Belongs to Me" from Cabaret mm-hmm. it was written by, I think, a gay Jewish man, right? Uh, but it's been co-opted by Nazis because it makes them look kind of badass, right? Yeah. Uh, but uh, as somebody pointed out, "Springtime for Hitler" has not been co-opted by Nazis. <laughs> It makes right. them look ridiculous. <laughs> yes, yes. So that's right. I mean, that's part of it. Uh, so you it, don't hear them going, "Don't be stupid, be a smarty, <laughs> come and join the Nazi party." <laughs> yeah, yeah. You no. said it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's true. If you can make Nazis look a bit ridiculous, that uh, that seems to be more effective. In yeah, some ways. but it remains to be, you know, whether this book accomplishes that. You know, yeah. it it's up to 
individual interpretation, I think. Even then, you sometimes wonder, because, like, um, it's not a Nazi character, but Rorschach from Watchmen, of course, famously has his hangers on. And there's the Joker, as we yeah. know, there is going to be a Joker movie. And both those characters are constantly being made to look ridiculous and sad and small and pathetic. And yet they have their hangers on who yeah, think they're cool true. and badass. So it's you really never know. hard to know how these things are going to go. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Anyway, I think uh, it's time. I think we're hitting our point. Uh, I did want to mention uh, that I have a Kickstarter going on. Uh, Myself and uh, DM Elms, uh, who is a contributor to Strange Romance, are working on a Kickstarter for a uh, a comic, uh, part of a a larger project we've got going called the uh, Extended Play Comics Group. Uh, we're just uh, going to do this uh, fun kids comic, which is part of an imaginary line of kids comics, somewhat inspired by the Star Comics of the 80s. Uh, so if you're interested, uh, look for that on Kickstarter. Uh, we've just launched it very recently, and uh, we'd uh, love it if you'd like to chip in. I'm doing the art, Dee's, drawing the, or Dee's writing the story, and we think it's going to be a lot of fun, so check it out. Well, that's it for the latest What Mad Universe. I'm Supreme Commander Adam Prosser. With me is Philip Rice, first of the new genetic supermen. The show was produced by Alex Ross, the Master Dominator, and the theme song was by that mutant rabble, Jack Fierick. We'll be back with all the snap and dash you've come to expect from us in two weeks' time. So long until then. <laughs>